This series of screencasts covers heaps and their applications in sorting and priority queues. Heaps are nearly complete binary trees that satisfy a heap property that organizes data under a partial ordering of their keys, enabling access to elements with maximum or minimum keys without having to pay the cost of fully sorting the keys. They're not to be confused with garbage collected storage. What better place to associate with heaps than the biggest heaps on Earth, the volcanoes of the Big Island? We'll take a tour as we build and explore heaps. First, we'll examine the definition and properties of heaps. Conceptually, heaps are nearly complete binary trees. They have leaves on most two adjacent levels, and in which the leaves at the bottommost level lie in the leftmost positions. Let's take a look. So here is an example of a heap. As I mentioned, heaps have leaves at at most two levels, the bottommost level L and level L minus one. And the bottommost level is filled out from left to right. So in this sense, they are nearly complete binary trees. Some quantitative properties concerning full and nearly complete binary trees will be useful in understanding heaps. As you may recall from our discussion of binary tree properties in the previous screencasts, a complete binary tree has at most 2 to the h plus 1 minus 1 nodes when it's completely full. We can see this by adding up the number of elements at each level. So at the first level, there's 2 to the 0, which is 1. The second level, there's 2 to the 1 or 2, 2 to the 2, which is 4. 2 to the h, because remember we are numbering 0, 1, 2, 3 as the height of the tree. Then we just have to apply the formula. You can find it in the back of the Corman text, this formula. It's formula A5 in the appendix. So if we set, let's set uh, x equals 2 because that's the item being raised to a power and let's set n to be h because that's going to be the exponent and so this becomes 2 to the h plus 1 minus 1 over 2 minus 1 which is of course equal to 2 to the h plus 1 minus 1. So a nearly complete binary tree well, if it's complete, it will have 2 to the h plus 1 minus 1 elements. But what about the fewest number of elements it can have? Well, that holds when the last level, L, has only one element. So what we can do is apply this formula where the height is h minus 1, and then just add 1 to the result. So instead of 2 to the h plus 1, it will be 2 to the h minus 1 so we get 2 to the h minus 1 elements up to the very last one plus 1 for the very last node there and so that's going to be a total of 2 to the h element so we get as a result between 2 to the h and 2 to the h plus 1 minus 1 elements or nodes or vertices are in these trees Okay, so if there are between 2 to the h and 2 to the h plus 1 minus 1 elements, then what is the height of an n element nearly complete binary tree? Well, let's just say set the lower bound on the number of elements and the upper bound and to simplify we're going to get rid of this minus 1. We're going to say that's less than to the h plus 1. Let's take the log of the first and second and last terms. So what's the log of 2 to the h? Well it's simply h less than or equal to what's the log of n? Log n less than log of 2 to the h plus 1 is h plus 1. So this bounds what h can be in terms of n but since h is an integer, we have h is equal to the floor of log n. 
We're going to note a couple other facts without proving them. So one of them is the number of leaves. It can be shown that if there are n elements in the complete binary tree, or a nearly complete binary tree, then we have n over 2 ceiling leaves. What about number of nodes in a given level, nodes of a height h? We can prove by contradiction that there are at most the ceiling of n over 2 h plus 1 nodes of height h in a nearly complete binary tree. So we're going to use these facts, this fact, this fact, and this fact in our subsequent analyses. But so far I've only told you that heaps need to be nearly complete or possibly complete binary trees. I haven't really told you what a heap is. So let's look at the heap property and how heaps are represented in arrays. And I'm sure you realize that the images are from the summit of Mauna Kea. Depending on whether it's a max heap or a min heap, to be a heap, the binary tree must also satisfy a heap property. So let's first look at the max heap property, which is that for all nodes, the key of the parent is greater than or equal to the key of i. So you can see this in this diagram here. This is a max heap. Pick any node, node 7, the parent key is bigger. Node 9, the parent key is bigger. Node 3, the parent key is bigger, and so on. But we can also flip it. For certain other applications, we can have a min heap. And the min heap property, as you can guess, is just the reverse of the above. Of course, the key of each node is greater than or equal to the parent's key in a min heap. So notice that the max heap is max because the, if you do by induction the parent all the way up, this must mean that the root node is the largest node in the heap. So if you pulled out the largest node, you would get the max of the set. Min heap property, if the parent is less, then by induction going up the tree, the largest node must be the min. These have their own unique applications. For example, for the uh, max, there's applications to things like priority queues, such as when you're running jobs on a computer, a shared computer, and you give different jobs different priorities. And perhaps over time, you increase the priority of a job because it's been waiting for a while. The min heap is used, among other things, for simulations. This might be where the, the key of the item in the heap is a timestamp and you want to queue up events to be executed and you want to execute the events in temporal order, but they may not be em generated in the same order as they're going to be executed. So let's look at the array representation of a heap. So let's do it using this heap that we've drawn here as an example. It has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 elements, but there's potentially 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 elements. So let's draw an array of 15 elements. Looks like I ended up with uh, 16 elements. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. But that's OK, because the array representation of a heap starts from the beginning of the ray and just fills it out row by row level. So if we put 16 here and then we go 14, 10, and then 8, 7, 9, 3, 2, 4, 1, and the rest are empty in this case. That gives us room to expand. So this makes, this is a very nice representation. It makes it very fast to access elements of the heap um, we're actually representing it as an array, but we think about it as this tree. So it's it's really elegant and interesting idea. And we see this a lot in computer science, where you have dual ways of looking at a data structure. You know, it's really an array, but we think of it as this structure. This is a, a very powerful idea.
So how do we actually access, if we don't have, you know, child pointers, how do we access the children and parents of elements in this heap, which is a binary tree? Well, let's look at what is the root. Where would you find the root of the tree if this was an array A? Well, it's always element 1, right? What about the parent of some element A sub i? Where would you find that? It turns out that you just go to A sub the floor of i divided by 2. So you take i, let's say you want the parent of uh, 9, which is in position 6, i is 6. So 6 divided by 2 is 3, so the parent is 10. Let's check that up here. Yep, that's right. What about the parent of an odd-numbered one, 9? Okay, 9 divided by 2 is 4.5, but we take the floor, that's 4. So the parent of 4 is in position, is 8. So that's correct, too. Pretty quick, very fast computation. You don't need the extra storage space of pointers. Let's now look at left child and right child. And this is implied that this is of a sub i. Well, the left child, we're kind of reversing this operation here. Is a sub 2i, and the right child, a sub 2i plus 1. Really simple math. In fact, these operations can be done basically by in a binary representation just by shifting bits over and then in this case adding one at the low order bit. So let's look at that again. The left child is 2 of i. What's the left child of, oh, I don't know, 14? Uh, that would be 2 of i, which would be 4, which is 8. So yes, that's true. What's the right child of um, uh, 7? OK, it's at position 5, so it's 10 plus 1 is 11. It doesn't have one. Ah, OK. Right child of 8? That would be 8 plus 1 is 9, which is 4. Right. So very fast, very elegant mapping between two representations. One final really important property of heaps, now that we've seen the array representation, is to understand where the leaves, the indices of the leaves, lie. If there are n elements stored in a heap in the array representation, then the leaves are in these positions n over 2 plus 1. Sorry, that's the floor of n over 2 plus 1. n over 2 floor plus 2 up to n. So for example, here we have again 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 elements. Yes, 10 elements. And so that's 10 divided by 2 is 5. So the leaves start at position uh, 5 plus 1, which is 6, and that is the case. Here's the leaf here, number 9, number 3, number 2, 4, 1. So we're going to use this fact to know where, this is really important right here. If we want to run a process that starts with the leaves or that skips over the leaves because we don't have to do the leaves, then we will skip these. And we'll see that in the next section. So that concludes our introduction to heaps, their basic properties, and their representations as the sun sets on Mauna Kea with a view of Mount Hualalai.